So, step two, um, explore alternative fuels and energy types. Um, so really, now I'm going to talk to you about heavy duty vehicles. So in the previous unit, we discussed um, you know, the air quality and the health impacts and um, impacts on climate change. So now we're going to discuss the second of the two approaches needed to help tackle these issues and others, and including things like congestion and cost and stuff like that. Um, so now this one is really going to focus on heavy duty vehicles. And so that's going to include buses <clears throat> as well. So there's a few different types available. I'll, uh, I'll show them to you now very briefly. So gas, buses and trucks, both generally available. Um, perhaps not so much in the, in the, in the truck segments, um, but yeah, generally available, but heavy trucks, not so much. Um, biofuel, again, if they're available, um, again, buses, not all trucks, not quite there yet, but that's sort of there. Um, buses, again, hybrids, very much um, available. And trucks, again, not so much, but available for some very specific types of truck, um, but not, certainly not all types of truck. Um, plug-in hybrids, there are some trials happening with buses and plug-in hybrids and that they will probably continue for a little while longer. Um, some uh, OEM, some manufacturers are certainly running trials in some cities, sometimes with EU funding and that it's the kind of thing that you might be able to be involved in for example if, you're, if you uh, are a local authority and you can you know, offer a bus route and some kind of incentive. Um, again, with, with, with trucks Plug-in hybrids really not not properly available. There's a few sort of demonstration type trials available, but not not really. Um, electric again, electric buses available. You have to really consider the route they're going on, though. But then they're available, but they're not you know they're not as a um, as, as as commonplace and easy as a, as a diesel bus. Um, same with trucks. Again, there's some electric trucks available, but they're they're not quite what you expect from a diesel or, or, or petrol, they have issues obviously if the battery weighs, it weighs a lot um, so the load issues then, then come in so where you, you, you just can't carry as much goods as you'd like to be able to carry. Um, again, hydrogen, that's quite a long way off, trials in, in both segments, particularly buses, um, but they're much further away than, than, than all of the other ones. So alternative fuel vehicles do exist, but they're, they're not really that available. Um, so the issue is that there's um, there's buses that tell you what they're going to run on um, and the, 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 the diesel buses and, and trucks and there's a, there's a cycle, a test cycle that they're tested against and that produces euros that, well, that m means they meet the euro standard. Um, however this euro standard is, is based just on the engine rather than the whole type approved vehicle, which means that if that engine is put into a different application, um, for example, if it's if it's designed to be run on a truck and it's put in a bus, then the emissions are going to be very different to what is advertised. So there is a new drive cycle that's being developed um, called SORT, S-O-R-T, um, and you should sort of use and make use in your assessments is the SORT drive cycle rather than standard one, if, 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 if at all possible. Um, so yeah, it has the urban, semi-urban and, and rural base buses um, running, rather than, rather than what, what you might expect with a normal Euro standard, which is really based on a truck sitting there, uh, an engine designed for a truck sitting there doing a truck duty cycle on a motorway or, or you know, on, on a straight piece of road going at 55 miles per hour, or, you know, how many kilometres that is. Whereas the sort cycle looks at stop-start behaviour associated with, with a bus. Um, so general rules for hybrid heavy-duty vehicles, if you're going to consider them. Um, they, the operator who is driving the vehicle isn't really going to notice a difference. Um, they're, really, they're really suited to stop-start, as you might expect. Huge savings can actually be had, um, up to 30% um, with the latest, more than that, with the latest hybrid buses. Um, but only really when they're used in a real stop starts. As you can imagine, there's a, a battery that can be charged as the bus is braking and then used as the bus um, moves off again. 
So the stop-start conditions associated with urban driving really do suit hybrids, and there are quite significant savings. Um, there's not really any ad adaptation required. You don't have to do anything different. You just buy the vehicles, run them as usual. You might need some extra things in your maintenance side. Um, so the, the garage technicians might require a bit more training, or they might um, be specialist people who, who come in from the bass manufacturer that, that do all of the hybrid side, the, the electrics um, side of the vehicle. Um, so yeah, lots of fleets around Europe, such as London and Barcelona, have got hybrid buses, and a lot of them. Um, they're becoming more prevalent, and the costs, although they do cost more, and they probably would require some kind of um, subsidy to actually make them financially viable, um, because even though there are savings over their lifestyle, lifetime, the savings don't generally match the extra costs associated with purchasing the vehicle. So subsidies are probably going to be required for a good few years with hybrid buses. Um, they, they're still, you know, relatively, they, um, they're, they're not too much more expensive than a conventional bus and you might be able to justify the, uh, the extra cost um, because of the air quality associated emission savings and, and the CO2 savings as well. Um, much less common in trucks. There are some trials with refuse trucks, for example, obviously another stop-start situation with a refuse truck, um, so hybrid makes a lot of sense, but um, not something really for the here and now to consider, whereas hybrid buses really are. They're something that you can procure most of the time right now for most situations. Um, the general rules for gas and biofuel vehicles. Um, again, they're, convention they're similar to conventional ICE, but um, instead of using diesel, they use an alternative combustion uh, material. So a, they can come from various different renewable sources, um, so crops and waste and, uh, and lots of the amount of different ways you can get biofuels will um, you know, blow your mind to be honest with you. Um, there are lots of different ways and uh, considering where it comes from is going to be something that's, that's very important when you are um, considering particularly CO2 savings. So I know that in Scandinavia for example they've got a very well set up system which means that they get biofuels that have very little CO2 associated with the production um, and so they'll be able to claim huge CO2 benefits from running these types of vehicles. Um, so gas vehicles, straight gas vehicles, um, will either be uh, liquefied as LNG or compressed as com uh, compressed natural gas. Um, generally an LNG vehicle, um, I mean a, a gas tank for an LNG vehicle will be you know, this kind of size and be able to have the same amount of gas as a number of large gas tanks for uh, compressed natural gas, it's, it's far more space efficient. So liquefied natural gas you often find in tractor units, so the, the uh, front bit of an articulated vehicle for example, because they don't have very much space to fit gas tanks on. Whereas a CNG vehicle, so uh, compressed natural gas, there's obviously lots of room on top of a single decker bus for example, where the CNG tanks can fit. Um, obviously this gas can come from renewable sources such as biogas. Um, now, there are many heavy vehicles um, and dif different types of, sort of variations of these available, mostly in the sort of trial stages. There are commercially available vehicles certainly out there. Um, they're less kind of uh, well developed as, um, as diesel and petrol vehicles, or diesel vehicles obviously, but they are certainly developed enough for you to seriously consider them as an alternative fuel. Um, you obviously need to think of the refuelling infrastructure, but most of the time for bus operations and some truck operations, that's not really an issue because all the refuelling will happen within the depot. Um, so, yeah, you think about different sources and consider the CO2 associated with the different sources. Um, and, yeah, sometimes they can be close to uh, zero or, or, or lower than zero, depending on how they're produced. Um, so now, electric. So, it may not be as simple as just building, um, you know, considering what type of fuel you're going to use for the vehicle and then running the vehicle as standard. You might actually have to really think about running the route around what infrastructure you can give for that route. So, for example, um, there's lots of examples of buses running operationally. For example, Nottingham in the UK has got a fleet of almost 50 buses. Fairly soon it will be more than 50 buses. 
Um, and they're running uh, you know, commercially viable bus routes. They're, they're, they're getting the uh, electricity from a municipal waste um, centre. It's a really good example of electric buses being, re being used sort of commercially um, in the UK. There are subsidies in place to make that work, but um, yeah, they certainly are operationally used. And in China, there's huge amounts of examples of electric buses being used for urban routes. Um, what you really need to think about, though, is where the vehicle is going to be charged. Now, if you've got a fairly simple light route that maybe you know has a lot of space in that route for charging to happen, that's one thing. But if you're running a very, very difficult urban city centre route where the buses are often delayed because of traffic and things like that, you don't want a stranded bus in the middle of nowhere. So you need to really have maybe charging at either end, some kind of novel charging mechanism, or a very big battery that allows um, the bus to run for, for, for most of the route, or most of its day, on that battery. Um, things you need to then think about, though, is that if the battery is taking up so much of the weight, you might not be able to fit as many passengers, or be allowed to have as many passengers on board with the weight of the battery associated. Um, what maybe another example is if a bus route has perhaps you know, generally diesel vehicles or hybrid vehicles on it, you then maybe just insert one or two electric buses into that route for say the peak hours for example, where there, you know, there's less demand. So if, if, if the bus runs out of, uh, of electricity after maybe doing three or four routes, it's not so important because the peak's over and it can then charge during the off-peak period and then go back out for the peak again in the, in the afternoon and evening. Um, so yeah, there are some examples of electric trucks, but they're generally not so commercially used, um, but worth thinking about. Um, the other thing we're thinking about charging is, um, are, are you going to be able to charge your bus? Um, now there's generally three regimes for charging. One regime is where you just charge your bus entirely up at the beginning of the day, it runs its route, gets home, charge up overnight, runs its route the next day. The other one is you have a far smaller battery or energy storage system on board, and at either end it gets you know, very, very fast charged. Smaller battery, um, probably a bit cheaper, more expensive on the infrastructure side, cheaper on the bus side, uh, more passengers uh, can fit on the bus um, with, with the weight and restrictions. And then the third one is, is a mixture of the two, where it does charge overnight, and during the day, as the battery is depleted, it's then topped up a bit at the end, either, either end of the route. Um, and there's maybe a bit more flexibility with that, that system. Um, CO2 is generally reduced with that type of um, type of radio or any type of electric bus that's used, and the PM and NOx are, you know, will be zero from the bus, and, and that's where the sensitive receptors generally are um, where the bus is running, so it's certainly a proven there. Um, they can be more expensive to purchase, that's something certainly to consider, um, but then the reduced running costs, often because you're not buying diesel, um, can, uh, can outweigh the extra cost of, of, of purchasing the bus there. But again, that's something really, really to consider and, and uh, demonstrate sometimes before you're able to purchase the vehicles. Um, so general rules for plug-in hybrid, they don't really exist at present, there's only trials, um, but what they're going to have is a diesel engine, and a electric motor in the same way as a plug-in hybrid car has. Um, sometimes that engine will then run the wheels themselves, or sometimes the engine will run char charge up the battery, and the battery will always be running, running the engine, running the vehicle. Um, now, the I mean the issues with that is they are more expensive. You've got a lot more technology on board. But um, the, the benefit is that you are able to run those vehicles almost exclusively, potentially in zero emission um, mode, and only have the engine as a backup, potentially during peak times when the bus isn't able to stop at either end because of the traffic, or um, you know, potentially during, towards the end of the day if, if the battery is more depleted. Um, now, another thing that is being looked at is having the electric only bit of the route. Um, to be geofenced. So, for example, your city centre, I mean, you may have the electric only mode during the city centre running of the bus. So, this means that the bus obviously um, doesn't produce harmful emissions where the main issue is, the quality issue is. Um, it's, it's certainly something that's being considered um, around, around the UK and 
uh, yeah, something to think about if you're going to go for these buses. But again, as I say, they really are in their infancy at the moment. Um, but there are manufacturers producing these buses and they will need to trial them and demonstrate them somewhere. So, something to consider. Now, hydrogen, it's, it's, it's not really something you're going to be associated with in the short term. But over the next, especially if you're, if you're thinking of hydrogen, um, hydrogen buses, um, over the next few years, there's going to be European calls, big European calls for running um, hydrogen buses in your city. So um, there's a thing called the fu Joint Fuels, Hydrogen Fuels Undertaking. Um, if you Google that, you can find out more information about it. And potentially, if you're interested, you can, you can get involved in some of those large scale demonstrations. Um, yeah, and you're looking at more around the 2020 timescale for them to be potentially be more effective. Um, so, if you would like to tell me about the bus route in your town, um, if you are running this training yourself, obviously at this point you would ask people in the room about their um, the bus route in their town. Um, ask the questions, you know, what is the current duty cycle? Do you have any low emission buses um, going? at the moment in your city um, and what type of budget do you have potentially to trial these types of vehicles, these types of novel vehicles.